Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our to our lecture series. Basically, the question is, what is the what is what in the world is going on? And today, it is going on with Russia. And Mark Millard, Mark Millard. Wow, that's bad. He is a, he is a dear friend, <laughs> as are you. <laughs> Mark Drake will be leading us in this. Uh, and he has asked that after we offer thanks that we read together Ezekiel 38. So let us rise, give thanks to our Lord for the opportunity to be here and study his word. Our beloved Lord and Father in heaven, thou hast blessed us abundantly with the things that thou hast given in this world. We have more than enough food, and shelter, clothing. Thou hast blessed us in many things beyond this. But thy greatest blessing is thy word. And it is that that we are here for, Father, that we might know and understand thy word more clearly. And in knowing it, to become more committed to doing what is right in thy sight. So this day, Father, we, we study what thou hast told us about the events that are soon to come to pass in the Middle East. The methods by, by which those things will be done. And the glory of it all the result. Help us to clearly understand these things, Father, and to organize our lives around them, knowing that it is by develop, developing a love for thee, a commitment to thy service, that we are found acceptable in thy sight. Strengthen us in this. Teach us thy truth, we pray, through your Son, our Lord Jesus the Christ. As I mentioned, Mark has asked that we read from Ezekiel chapter 38. So I'll give you a moment to find that in your Bibles or laptops, whichever comes first. Ezekiel 38. The word of Yahweh came to me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus saith Adonai Yahweh, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. I will turn thee back, and put hooks into thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth, and all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords, Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all his bands, the house of Tagarma of the north quarters and all his bands, and many people with thee. Be thou prepared and prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. After many days thou shalt be visited. In the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword, and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste. But it is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. Thou shalt ascend and come like a storm. Thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land, thou and all thy bands, and many people with thee. Thus saith Adonai Yahweh, it shall come to pass, that at the same time shall things come into thy mind, and thou shalt think an evil thought, and thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates, to take a spoil and to take a prey, to turn thine hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited and upon the people that are gathered out of the nations which have gotten cattle and goods that dwell in the midst of the land. Shiva and Dedan, the merchants of Tarshish, with all the young lions thereof, shall say unto thee, Art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey, to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to take a great spoil? Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say unto Gog, Thus saith Adonai Yahweh, In that day, when my people of Israel dwelleth safely, shalt thou not know it? And thou shalt come from the, thy place out of the north parts, thou and many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses, a great company, a mighty army. Thou shalt come up against my people of Israel, 
as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days, and I will bring thee against my land, that the heathen may know me when I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. Thus saith that now Yahweh, Art thou he of whom I have spoken in old time by my servants, the prophets of Israel, which prophesied in those days many years that I would bring thee against them? It shall come to pass at that same time when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, saith Adonai Yahweh, that my fury shall come up in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel, so that the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the heaven and the beasts of the field and all creeping things that creep upon the earth and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. And the mountains shall be thrown down and the steep places shall fall. and Every wall shall fall to the ground. And I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains, saith Adonai Yahweh. Every man's sword shall be against his brother. And I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood. And I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him an overflowing rain, great hailstones, fire, and brimstone. Thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am Yahweh. Without further ado, we'll call upon Brother Mark. Thank you for that introduction and that reading. Well, as uh, has been announced, this is the next, uh, next talk in our whole series of, uh, of talks entitled, What in the World is Going On? And, uh, you know, I don't think we could have a better week, actually, to be asking that question. Um, after what happened this past Tuesday with the presidential election, um, many people in this world are asking, uh, what in the world is going on? I mean, they just did not see what happened, you know, what was coming with... Uh, with our president-elect, uh, it caught everybody as quite a shock. And, um, well, within that election cycle, uh, we come to find out even a couple days after that, as we're talking about Russia today, you know, President uh, Putin of Russia uh, had something to do with the uh, communications with our president-elect Trump um, even in the, the midst of the whole election cycle. So it's a, it's a very timely topic that we're talking about here today. So as we read Ezekiel chapter 38, um, many of you may know, but some of you may not, um, that Russia is actually spoken of in this chapter. You know, if, if you're not very familiar with the chapter, you may not have seen any reference to Russia itself. Um, but that's what we want to take a look at first, is how do we come to the, to the understanding that Russia is actually mentioned in Scripture? And specifically, uh, we're going to use Ezekiel chapter 38 sort of as a, as a structure to see what is going to be happening uh, with Russia. So, in the past few years, actually, Russia has been in the news quite, quite often. Um, most of the time, uh, when we hear about Russia uh, making headlines, um, it has been for you know, incursions into the Ukraine, uh, into Crimea, um, things having to do with the, uh, the embattled city of Aleppo. Right? We, we, we understand that there are uh, sanctions being placed upon the nation of Russia uh, for their involvement in certain things that the rest of the world uh, may not think they should have their, their hands and their military in. You know, we see headlines like this. The US and UK say they're weighing new sanctions on Syria and Russia, right? So we have the US and the UK on one side, we have Russia on the other. So we're seeing just, you know, very briefly that we have uh, a line being drawn between the West 
and Russia on the other side. We see things like this then after the election on Tuesday. Could there be a Trump-led thaw between Russia and the US to undermine any EU unanimity over sanctions? Right, so now, okay, well, after what happened on Tuesday, and we have a new president coming in who's a little friendlier with Mr. Putin, is that now going to cause any sort of a problems with the EU imposing sanctions upon Russia? And maybe President-elect Trump saying, well, let's rethink that. Right? So, you know, the world is, what's going to happen here? What exactly is going to be happening? Okay, well... Again, all of these have been taken within the past couple of weeks. Uh, this is very, very recent information. So the EU has been set to extend Russia sanctions. Right? The European Union is likely to extend economic sanctions on Russia over the Ukraine in December, but could find it much harder to renew them in the future if Donald Trump succeeds in warming up relations with Russia. You see, we, the news outlets don't know what to do about this. They're all questioning now with this new installation of, of our uh, president-elect, what is going to happen specifically with relations having to do with the US, the UK, and the EU with Russia? So here they are, set to extend Russian sanctions, but then EU leaders fail to agree on threatening Russia with sanctions over Aleppo. They, they don't know what to do. They don't know how to react because they're not sure of what their relationship, the Russian relationship, is going to be with Europe, with the United States, with the West. Everything is up in the air. So that's why we, we've come here to kind of talk about what is going to be happening with Russia. We hear about them so often. What should we be looking forward to? Well, as these are very, very current things that we're looking at here, uh, we're actually going to start our consideration of Russia in scripture uh, a long, long time ago actually further back than what we read of in Ezekiel 38. Our story is actually going to start back in the time of King Josiah, which was uh, some time before Ezekiel prophesied. Now, when Ezekiel gives his prophecy of an invasion coming from the north, as uh, Brother Mike read for us, from the north quarters, verse 15 of chapter 38, thou shalt come uh, from thy place out of the north parts, I will cause thee to come up from the north parts. Right, so we have this invasion from the north coming down. Well, we see that shortly before Ezekiel's time, there actually was an invasion from the north that came down into the, uh, uh, the nation of Israel and down into Judah. And it was really only about 45 years since that particular invasion that uh, Ezekiel now gives his prophecy. And it was the Scythians that had come down from the north and had swept down into the land. And it would have been in the memory of many who lived in Ezekiel's time. So as Ezekiel is now prophesying of another invasion to come, they would have had that in their memory and it would have frightened them very, very seriously. Well, during this invasion, they came down uh, from the north, like I said, they came down through uh, the land of Israel, down through Judah, and they made it all the way down to the border of Egypt, and that's where they stopped. So the Scythians stopped at the border of Egypt, and they only stopped there because Pharaoh Samtek actually paid them off. Uh, he gave them silver and gold and said, please, stop, go home, paid them off. They turned around, and they went back where they came from. Now, these Scythians, as we're going to see on uh, uh, the next slide here, uh, they were known for their ferocity, their swiftness, and their savagery. This was not a, uh, uh, a peaceful invasion. You know, They would just want to come down and pass through your land. This was something that terrified and horrified the people that had to uh, be subjected to it, the, the survivors. Now, what we find is that this particular invasion was led by a Scythian, the descendant of a Scythian leader named Gog. And we're going to see where that comes up in just a few minutes. But this is the Gog, as we started reading in chapter 38 of Ezekiel. Verse 2, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog. 
chief prince of Meshach and Tubal and prophesied against him. What we're going to find that this most likely was not a proper name, but more of a title or an inherited family name that gets passed down from generation to generation. So just a, a quick map to show where the Scythians would have come from as they made their way down from the north. So you can see the Caucasus Mountains um, up at the top of the screen, right up there by the Caspian Sea. The Black Sea would be over you know, to, to your left there, which you can't see. They made their way down through Assyria and down into uh, the land of Phoenicia, down into uh, Israel and Judah, and like I said, all the way down to the border of Egypt. Now this, again, took place at the time of King Josiah, right? So I just wanted to give you a little glimpse of where they came from, because that's going to be important later, that they came down from the north on the other side of the Caucasus Mountains. And again, this is just another uh, little more detail of where they came from. And the red line on the left that comes down shows their route as they came down to the border of Egypt. Now, verse 2 of Ezekiel 38, as we've just quoted, says, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog. All right, so we want to try to identify now this Gog of the land of Magog. Where is this land of Magog? Well, the uh, Jewish historian Josephus tells us that Magog, the Magogites were called the Scythians by the Greeks, right? So me asserting that the Scythian invasion coming down uh, had some relevance to what, um, what Ezekiel was prophesying. Okay, mm -hmm. so we're seeing a little bit of that now. The Magogites were called the Scythians by the Greeks. Another historian said that uh, the Magog were an Aryan people who in the time of Herodotus, around 400 BC, were distributed over southern Russia. Okay, so the Magogites, the land of Magog, located in, over southern Russia. And another Russian historian said the Scythians, or the Scythians, ruled southern Russia from the seventh to the end of the third century BC. So I think we have a little uh, you know, leg to stand on when we're talking about the Magogites being in the vicinity of the southern part of where Russia is today, and that's where they came from. So we have our first uh, connection here, the Scythians, the Magogites, uh, to the southern Russians that we would know of today. Now again, like I said, these particular Scythians uh, were not a, a peaceful people. But uh, A.P. Stanley, in his History of the Jewish Church, refers to the Scythians in this way says there was a storm always ready to burst with its discharge of horses and horsemen, of swords and shields, of bows and arrows, of staves and spears, and innumerable bands, horde, succeeding horde, a convulsion which should send a universal shudder through all living creatures. That's how the Scythians were viewed. It would send a universal shudder through all living creatures. Have you heard, if you were in the time of Ezekiel's prophecy, and you heard him saying that there's going to be a northern invasion led by Gog of the land of Mago coming back down into your land, this is how you're going to react, and this is exactly what you're going to think of. And if you read this, and if you listen to what we were reading uh, earlier uh, this afternoon, you see it sounds exactly like the invasion that Ezekiel speaks of in verse 4. It says, I will bring thee forth all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. And in verse 9, you shall ascend and come like a storm. You shall be like a cloud to cover the land, thou and all thy bands and many people with thee. So as the people that heard Ezekiel are thinking back on the prior Scythian invasion, that's exactly what they are going to be afraid of now. Are you saying that this is going to be happening again? Are we going to see this happen again? Now, the only difference is, of course, that Ezekiel says it's going to come to pass in the latter days. It wasn't immediately to happen. But he's telling them, what we have already seen happen is going to be enacted again. But it's not going to be now. It's going to come to pass in the latter days. Right? So, identifying the, 
the land of Magog with the Scythians of southern Russia. How can we be sure that uh, we're on the right path with this, this leader, this, this Gog of the land of Magog? Well, we can, uh, we can thank archaeologists uh, for doing their job and digging up something um, having to do with Ashurbanipal. So Ashurbanipal had uh, a cylinder on which he would record, you know, all things having to do with his kingdom. Well, they dug up one of these uh, cylinders, and on it, uh, a man named Curry, in the speaker's commentary tells us, it was not one of the least surprises we owe it to Assyriology to find that Gog, king of Magog of Ezekiel, was originally a real and historical person. No other, in fact, than the chief of the Scythians in Ashurbanipal's time. Probably a warrior sufficiently renowned to have survived as a byword of terror in the memory of later generations. And that's all we've been saying. As Ezekiel has been giving his prophecy now, they remember. They would remember because this man, this 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 title of the Gogian leader survived as a byword of terror in the memory of later generations. Now we're told, again in verse 2 of Ezekiel chapter 38, it says, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. Now we just want to take just a minute to look at this phrase, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. Because in the King James Version, which we've read from, that's how it's translated, the chief prince. You can translate the word, which is in the Hebrew, rosh. You can translate that word as chief or head. And it's, it's one way to uh, translate that word. But you'll find that many of the newer translations and many of the newer translators have come to a, a realization that it probably shouldn't have been translated as head or chief prince, but that it should have been translated as the proper name. Just completely taken the word Rosh and keep it as a proper name, right? The uh, revised version, New American Standard, New English Bible, Rotherhams all translate their um, translations as the proper name, as the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, as though it were a territory, just like Meshach and Tubal were. So they leave it as Rosh. Well, Jesenius, uh, a very renowned he Hebrew scholar, if you look up Rosh in his uh, lexicon here, as I have up on the screen, he says that the word Rosh refers undoubtedly to the Russians, who are mentioned by the Byzantine writers of the 10th century under the name of the Ross or the Rosh. Okay. So here we have, I, I think we're you know, building up enough uh, evidence here that as we're reading the beginning of Ezekiel chapter 38, when we're talking about Gog and Magog and Rosh, and we're getting all of these scholars telling us this is referring to the Russians. This is referring to the territory of southern Russia. This is referring to uh, the, the leader of the Scythians who occupied southern Russia and who came down and did exactly what Ezekiel was talking about years before. I think we have uh, quite a bit of evidence here to show that what we're seeing here has to do with the area of Russia. And that's why I started out by saying Ezekiel's prophecy was not for Ezekiel's time, but it was to take place in the latter days, our times, the end times. Now, there are no longer Scythians that we need to be afraid of, that we need to worry about. Um, you can't go and find the Scythians now and say, oh, look, there's a group of Scythians here li living in uh, southern Russia. But why we want to look at this and identify where they were and the people where they, where they lived and where they came down from, is because when you're looking at prophecy in scripture, to identify a latter-day prophecy and its fulfillment you have to identify where the prophet would have understood those particular people and nations to have been at his time. And they were identified as living in the territory of Russia 
at that time. So when we're looking for a latter-day fulfillment, that's where we want to look. That's exactly where we want to look, people who live on the same territory as the people that were being referred to in the prophet's time. So, hence the title, What in the World's Going On with Russia? This is the territory that we're looking at. These are the people that we want to focus on at this particular time. More evidence? Well, who is Rosh or Russia combined with here at the beginning of this prophecy? Well, Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. Well, the first uh, couple of references to Meshach and Tubal we'll find in Genesis chapter 10. Uh, they were sons of Japheth. We find that their descendants in Assyrian inscriptions are referred to as the Mushkai and the Tabalai. Makes sense. Mushkai, Meshach, Tabalai, Tubal. You see the, the uh, similarity in the names. And if you follow their, um, their history, you'll find that they were pushed northwards up beyond the Caucasus Mountains as they made their way and the, uh, the sons of Noah and the Japhethites moved um, and, and finally settled. You're going to find that these particular uh, Meshach and Tubal were pushed up beyond the Caucasus Mountains. And they settled in a, a place in Ezekiel's time, as it says here on the screen, that would have corresponded to modern-day uh, Georgia, in Armenia, and perhaps part of Turkey. Okay, so just keep that in mind. And you'll also find that Moscow and Tobolsky, two Russian cities, um, would have derived their names from these two particular people, Meshach and Tubal. If you look at old maps, um, you're going to find that rivers, cities along uh, the path of their migration carry their names forth and you can, ca you can follow the uh, Moscovites, the Mushkai, and the uh, Tabalai until they located and finally settled up in the area that we're going to see in just a few minutes. Now, this was taken from the Herald of the Kingdom in the Age to Come. Uh, Brother Thomas is actually taking a, um, an article that was written by a, a rabbi, Rabbi Karilin. And he says this, he says, we know also and in former times, Russia was divided into three independent states. Russia, proper, or according to some authors, Moscovy in Europe. Moscovy proper, or, Russian, or Russia Eastern and Southern, and Tobolsk, or Northern Russia. You see here, he's saying it was divided up into three sections. Russia, Moscovy, and Tobolsk, or Northern Russia. The three states were finally united under the common name of Russia and they held in subjection several nations of the Tartar and Sclavonian origin. So you have here Rosh, Meshach, Tubal, all coming together to make up the modern Russia as we know it. So again, I, I don't want to beat this um, uh, into the ground trying to establish that when we're looking at the beginning of Ezekiel 38, that we are referring to a people the land that came from the territory of Russia as we know it today. So here we have a map showing the uh, significant players in Ezekiel chapter 38, uh, the names that we're going to find. Um, I did not make this map, so I apologize for the superhero Ezekiel 38 down at their bottom, but uh, it, was, uh, it was one that I could find that um, actually had them all in, in proper places uh, as close as we could find. So we have, on one side, we've got Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, with Gomer and Magog, Togarma and Persia, Libya and Ethiopia. So this is the invading force that was going to be coming down from the north. On the other side, uh, later on in Ezekiel 38, who do you have? You have Sheba and Dedan, and the merchants of Tarshish. You see Britain up there in the top left, Tarshish. So you have two groups at odds with each other, uh, on different sides of uh, this conflict that we're going to be talking about here uh, very briefly. Isaiah. Okay. So, as we're looking at this now, I want you to keep in mind where these particular groups 
are located. Okay, so you have Tagarma in Persia here, you have Gomer and Magog, Meshach, Tubal, and Rosh. Because Persia is modern day Iran. Okay, you've got uh, Libya, you've got Gomer over in the area of Europe, Germany, you've got Togarma, which is actually modern day Turkey and Iraq in the area of ancient Assyria. Okay, so when we're looking at these groups that are going to be aligned with Gog, Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, we find that it's going to be modern day Persia, Iran, Turkey, Iraq, and even over into Europe. These are the, uh, the groups that are going to be aligned with Russia when they come down against the land of Israel and finally meet their end there. Now we're looking mainly at Ezekiel 38 today. But I want you to be aware that there are companion prophecies to Ezekiel chapter 38. We're going to touch on a few of them today. We're not really going to look at them in detail, but you're going to find that if you would go to Daniel chapter 11, which we will shortly, Joel chapters 3 and 4, Zechariah chapters 13 and 14, uh, Revelation chapter 16, where we actually find a reference to Armageddon. Armageddon, the conflict that we are actually reading of in Ezekiel chapter 38. It's referred to as Armageddon in Revelation chapter 16. Now, if you were to read all of these prophecies together, you're going to find some extremely interesting similarities. It's going to take place in the latter times or in the latter years. The invasion is always going to come from the north or the uttermost parts of the north. You're going to find that nations are going to be gathered together. They're always coming down against the land of Israel. It's an overwhelming force. Um, it's, it's talked about like a river overflowing its banks, and a flood coming down and just completely inundating the area. And many times you'll find that it's also aligned with a great earthquake. Which is very, very interesting because we're going to take that, we can talk about this some other time, but you can take that literally because there are literal references to an earthquake happening right around this very time. The topography of the land actually being torn apart, but also symbolic or political earthquake because we have the change from the kingdom of men to the kingdom of God. And it's referred to in scripture as such an upheaval that it is a great earthquake. Right? The whole earth is shaken up. Now at this particular time, again, in each of these references, there is a divine intervention. God intervenes when the people come against Israel and the aggressor is destroyed. So you'll find all of those uh, uh, similarities as you look through these on your own. But again, like I said, we're using Ezekiel 38 as our main structure. Uh, for right now, we are going to take a look at Daniel chapter 11 for a few minutes. So we want to set some, um, set some history. Daniel chapter 11, it's a long chapter. Um, we're not going to read it all, but uh, hopefully in your in your time, you can peruse it yourselves, and you'll see that it really is a chapter concerning the conflict between the king of the north and the king of the south. That's what you're going to find again and again and again. That's how um, uh, Daniel's going to keep referring to it. Now, really what's being uh, looked at here with the king of the north and the king of the south are two great power centers that found their power after Alexander the Great's kingdom was divided at his death. And that's what you see down here. This is uh, Alexander the Great all in his, his tomb. So when Alexander dies, his kingdom is divided. It's actually divided to four generals, but we're only dealing with two. We're only dealing with one to the north and one to the south. To the north and south of the land of Israel. The one to the north was uh, under the power of General Seleucus, and the one to the south, Ptolemy. So that's really what we're going to be looking at in Ezekiel, I'm sorry, in Daniel chapter 11. So here's another map 
It's going to show the territory that was given to the king of the north and the king of the south. The king of the north, the Seleucid Empire, well, if you see, it's taking now, from our map earlier, it's taking up the area that was comprised of Persia, Togarma, Persia being Iran, Togarma being Iraq, and Turkey. Okay, so the king of the north, his territory comprised Turkey, Iraq, Iran, Syria. And I want you to keep all those in mind. So the king of the north, to be the king of the north in latter days, which is what we're going to be talking about here in just a minute, you would need to hold sway over the areas of Turkey, Iraq, Iran, and Syria in order to be a latter-day king of the north. Because the king of the north in Daniel chapter, uh, chapter 11 does exactly what the Scythian invasion was prophesied to do back in Ezekiel chapter 38. They come sweeping down into the land of Israel, overflow like a flood, come in, take all the land, go down into Egypt. This time they don't stop. They actually go straight down into Egypt and take Egypt. It says they take their gold and their silver and they come back up into the land of Israel. And it's there where the king of the north meets his end. Very quick summary of Daniel chapter 11, because we don't have time. But similarities with this advancement of the king of the north down into the land. We've already seen it. Great number of people all gathered together. The king of the north has many people at his steps. Again, if you were to look at Daniel chapter 11. Comes from the north, overwhelming force, comes down into the land of Israel. There's divine intervention and he meets his end on the mountains of Israel. These are companion passages. So what would we expect if we're looking from the latter days? Here we are, looking back at Ezekiel's prophecy of the latter days. We're here, saying what would we expect to see then? We want to see the fulfillment of Ezekiel's prophecy. Well, we want to see someone who is going to hold sway over Turkey, Iraq, Iran, and Syria. <coughs> Coming from the north. Having to do with the land of the Scythians that we've been talking about in the Caucasus Mountains. Russia, do they have anything to do with Iran, Iraq, Syria these days, Turkey? Well, let's look. What we want to do is just look at some, like I said, recent news articles having to do with Russia's involvement with these particular countries. Iran, or old Persia. Iran is willing to buy additional amounts of weapons from Russia, and the Russian government wants to positively respond to such requests as well, said Ali Akbar Velayati, and I apologize if that's not how you say it, uh, advisor to Iran's supreme leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei. They are in military, uh, they are militarily united here. Russia is supplying armaments to Iran. Very happy to do so. And Iran is very happy to take them up on it. Okay? Now with 425,000 strong armed forces, Iran is considered one of the most powerful military actors in this whole region. And you'll find that a remarkable amount of the Iranian um, inventory is made up of Soviet and Russian built systems. I mean, that is their military supplier. So not only, you know, militarily, Iran and Russia, but let's just say here, the Iranian, Russian, and Syrian foreign ministers held a trilateral meeting in Moscow on how to coordinate their efforts in the war on terrorists in Syria. Okay, so the Iranians, the Russians, and the Syrians are all meeting together conjointly to discuss what they're going to do on this war and terror in Syria. So we're starting to see some of the players that we've been looking for coming together. 
Iran, Russia, Syria, all meeting together, taking counsel one with another. Now, do you think that this would make the Jews, the Israelis, comfortable? I think not. I think they have a little bit of a problem with this. It says the Israeli, Israeli prime minister warns over Israel, uh, sorry, Iranian influence in Russian meetings. Right? It says here, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu held talks on Thursday with his Russian counterpart, Dmitry Medvedev, with the Israeli leader stressing he hoped to limit his arch foe Iran's influence in Syria. And you can see why. He says, okay, so there's this nation that wants to wipe us off the map and you, Russia, you're in Syria, and now you're taking counsel with our arch enemy as to how to conduct affairs in Syria. I have, I have a bit of a problem with that. This makes me uneasy. I would like it if you would limit any Iranian influence on military affairs in Syria. It's bad enough they're as close as they are. I'd rather not have them holding sway in Syria as well. As you can see, I mean, just from a couple, right, there, there are many, many of these we could uh, take a look at. There's quite a, an Iranian-Russian bond. Syria coming into the act. How about Turkey, which is the old uh, area of Togarma? Well, there's an alliance between Russia, Turkey, <coughs> And Iran on Syria taking shape. Turkey is considering a coalition with Russia and Iran against terrorists in Syria, just like we were saying. So this alliance now is forming, taking shape. And it's more than just a, a military um, alliance, but they're actually taking counsel together. Right? They're, they're asking one another, how should we... Um, approach this? How should we continue in this war in Syria? Well, again, the Turkish president said that he believes talks with Russian President Vladimir Putin offer a chance to open a new page in bilateral relations. So here we have a, a cozying up of, uh, I believe you pronounce his name, Erdogan. He's calling Putin his friend. So now Turkey and Russia are friends. Well, this wasn't always the case. If you remember, uh, last year sometime, uh, Putin decided to uh, fly one of his planes into uh, Turkish territory, and he ended up getting shot out of the sky. Um, relations went very, very cold at that particular time, or very, very hot, I mean, as you could say. I mean, there, there was a uh, uh, quite strained relationship at that particular time, but now he's trying to make amends, and he's calling Putin his friend, and he's trying to mend that relationship here. And this is exactly what we would think to see at the time of the end, the Turkey-Russia-Iran axis. A tectonic shift has occurred in the balance of power in the Middle East since the failed Turkish coup of mid-July and virtually no one in Washington is paying attention to it. Turkey and Iran are sim simultaneously moving toward Russia, while Russia is expanding its global military and strategic reach, all to the detriment of the United States and our allies. Okay, so again, you're going to have this Turkey, Russia, Iran axis for Togarma, Persia, and Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal all to the detriment of the United States and its allies. So it's just very, very interesting to watch what is happening here, um, especially the developments between Russia and Turkey. Because one of the main things that Russia and Turkey are going to be in, uh, in talks about is a proposed pipeline, proposed oil pipeline. Um, and you see here, it's actually referred to as the South Stream pipeline, and this is showing a, um, consider, considering a route. It comes down from Russia, under the Black Sea, and the proposed route actually came out in Bulgaria, and then up into Eastern Europe. And you can see, just by taking this into consideration, 
what kind of hold, if this goes through, Russia is going to have in Eastern Europe, and actually even going over in, you know, slightly into Western Europe. You see it's going over into Italy and up into Austria and towards Germany, supplying oil to Europe at this particular time. And that's what he's looking to do. And it's going to allow him to get a grip. It's going to allow him to hold sway over Eastern Europe and even into uh, Central Europe. Well, this was one of the proposed uh, routes. But recently, um, that has been <coughs> altered. I found this very, very interesting. Because now it's going to come down from Russia, and it's going to go through Turkey. See, not Bulgaria. Now Russia and Turkey are going to be unified by this particular pipeline if it goes through. This, again, this is the proposed route. So it comes down under the Black Sea and it goes right down by the Bosphorus and the Dardanelles, which are this little tiny little piece of the waterway. So the only way out of the Black Sea into the Aegean Sea and down into the Mediterranean. Very, very interesting um, strategic military points that you might want to get your hands on if you were, say, Russia, and you wanted to get your ships out of the Black Sea quickly down into the Mediterranean, possibly out through the Suez, and right down um, you know, towards, uh, towards India. Right now, Turkey holds sway over those passages. Russia is now going to put their pipeline right next door, and they're going to want to make sure that they keep uh, control over the access to that pipeline uh, very, very secure. So it's going to be interesting to see what uh, that might entail if uh, Russia decides to take any action in that particular area because they might want to get their hands on those two passages to get their ships out. And in order to get their hands on their passages, Putin might only have to do what he did just last year. Again, purely speculation, but I find this extremely interesting. When they shot the, when uh, Turkey shot down the plane, the first thing Putin did, says Putin accuses Turkey of backing ISIS after it downs Russian warplane in Syria. You shot down my plane, you are a terrorist, you are backing the terrorist, you know, he might have been right, but the first thing he comes out and he publicly <laughs> says, you are backing ISIS, Now, all he needs to do, if he gets upset with Turkey again, is say, you know what, I was right. <laughs> and it give him every opportunity now to come down into that area and to fight against Turkey, as though under the guise of fighting against ISIS, removing the backers of the whole ISIS threat in order possibly to take some control of the territory that he really wants. Now, again, speculation on my part, but I think it would be very, very interesting uh, development in that particular area. Because we find that even though <coughs> right now relations have been warming back up between Russia and um, Turkey, we know that that can't remain. How do we know that that can't remain that way? Well, back in Daniel chapter 11, king of the north comes against Turkey like a whirlwind. He comes through there with his chariots and horses and he takes it by force. And he continues on down into the glorious land. So it's not taken peacefully. He comes in with a military strike and takes it by force. So even though we're watching relations warming up between Turkey and Russia, we don't expect that they're going to remain that way. So. Now, not only would Putin like to get um, control over Europe by military force, by sending um, oil pipelines up into that, main, in that general area, but another thing that they've been doing over the past few years is actually trying to bind together the Russian Orthodox 
in the Roman Catholic Church so that there would be a religious binding together of those two areas. Very, very interesting because we find that uh, President Putin over the past few years has actually uh, backed the rebuilding of 23,000 Russian Orthodox churches. 23,000. He's making a very, very concerted effort to boost again the, the glory of the Russian Orthodox Church, and he's actually sanctioned the meeting together of the heads of the Russian Orthodox and the Roman Catholic Church. Now these two quotes, the church and the state are moving towards separating Russia from the West. They see the West as a danger and say they're fighting to save Russian souls. What kind of danger? Military danger? An economic danger? No, a moral danger. That, that's what he's pushing here. That's what, that's what Putin is pushing here. He has become a champion of the morality of the Russian Orthodox Church. Uh, he's made some very strong stands um, in Russia, uh, one of them being um, uh, laws passed against uh, homosexuality. And he says, I see the West as a, as a threat, as a danger. So that's why he's trying to boost again the Orthodox Church in his country and hopefully make inroads into the Roman Catholic European Church. He's trying to change minds. He's trying to change values. Now, during the days of the Tsar, the Russian ruler was seen as God's, listen to this, as God's chosen ruler of a Russian nation, tasked with representing a unique set of values embodied by Russian orthodoxy and was revered as the Holy Orthodox Tsar. And that's exactly what he's trying to do and exactly who he's trying to become. Holy Orthodox Tsar, not only of Russia. He's trying to become the king of the north. I mean, I hope we've, we've been able to see that. His ties with Turkey, his ties with Iran, his ties with um, Syria, right? He's trying to hold sway over that old Seleucid kingdom to become the king of the north, and he's doing it. He's doing it. We see him in Russia. I mean, we see him in Syria. We see him in Turkey. We see him in Iran. It's exactly what he's trying to become and time recognized it years ago. He doesn't want to be a premier or a president. He wants to be the czar, the Caesar, to resurrect what? The old Holy Roman Empire. The Holy Roman Empire not only ruled over by an emperor, but it had that religious element to it as well. And he aims to be both. Very, very interesting. Looking to resurrect the third Rome, as it were. And you can find a lot about that on the internet if you wanted to look it up. He wants to be seen as the divinely chosen autocrat. Now, my son Isaiah took a uh, shot at drawing Vladimir Putin. He wanted me to put it into our <laughs> into our presentation today. So here's our artwork from our our young Bible student. So Vladimir Putin. So again, we're backing back out. We're taking a look. We're, what are we really looking at here when we're looking at dissecting Ezekiel chapter 38 and looking at what's about to happen? Well, we're dealing with this area here, the Middle East. Now, when the king of the north in Daniel chapter 11 comes into this area of Turkey, where is he going to go? He's going to come straight down through here into Egypt. He's going to take Egypt. We know that from looking at Isaiah chapter 19. Egypt is going to be ruled over by a cruel and a, a cruel lord and a fierce king. That's in Isaiah 19, verse 4. He's going to come down, he's going to take Egypt. Just like, like I said, the initial Scythian invasion, that's where they were headed. They stopped because they were bought off. This time, they're not. They're going straight in and they're going to take what they want. They're going to turn around, come back up into Israel, set up base in Israel only to meet their end. 
Why did I go back up into Israel? <coughs> well, we have reference here about God putting uh, hooks into his jaws, right? We read that in Ezekiel 38. I'm going to turn you back. I'm going to put hooks into your jaws. I'm going to turn you around. And I'm going to bring you where I need you to be. I wonder if some of that evil thought is, again, that Iranian influence that Benjamin Netanyahu was worried about. Because the king of the north comes down into Egypt, but then it says, gets an evil thought. It wasn't his main intent, but all of a sudden he gets this evil thought. While I'm here, I'm going to go and I'm going to take the spoil of, I, of Israel while I'm at it. Right? So he turns around. The Israelis know. They know what's coming and they're in fear of it. Senior Israeli officers in both the Air Force and Navy consider the growing Russian role in the Middle East as dangerous and fear that a clash between Russia and Israel is only a matter of time. Israelis have focused their fears on the arrival of Russian aircraft carrier the Admiral Kuznetsov to Syria's shores. The ship includes 1,900 soldiers, carries 50 advanced warplanes, in addition to a wide range of cutting edge weapons. Now listen to this. The carrier is also able to detect all military movements in Israel, essentially exposing all, Israel, all Israeli military activities and can convey the information to hostile parties, such as Iran. That's really what they're worried about. Israelis are worried that the Russians may be passing information to the Iranians. They know that they're taking counsel together. We've seen it time and time again. And quite possibly the Iranian influence, again, my thought on it, um, could have something to do with this evil thought of while you're here, let's take care of this problem right now. And they want to take Israel out for the very last time. So as we've been looking at Russia and those who are in alignment with the Russian host, um, we do realize from Ezekiel 38 there is a, an opposing side. They refer to as Sheba and Dedan, and the merchants of Tarshish and the young lions thereof. Now, uh, Brother Jim, a few weeks ago, did a very, very good uh, class on that whole idea of Britain being the Tarshish of the latter days, I'm not going to rehash that. Just suffice it to say, if uh, you'd like to hear more about that, Brother Jim, let me talk to you. But what we're looking at here, the merchants of Tarshish, Sheba and Dedan, um, it, it's really looking at the, the British trading alliance. So Britain and their English-speaking colonies around the world, we see in, in every major conflict over the past say 20 years, who's always been allied together? The US, Britain, Canada, Australia, you know, New Zealand, uh, India, you know, they, they, they gather together in these times. Why? Militarily they're bound together and also they are merchants. They are trading partners and have been for years and years. I mean hundreds of years since the old uh, uh, East India Trading Company was set up by, um, by Britain. Now here's a map. Uh, uh, again, this is between 1750 and 1800. So I just want to get something that went a long time ago to see how, how long these, these nations have been bound together. So you see up here in Britain, these are all the trading routes. I mean, look where they go. Look where they go. <laughs> they go over to Canada. They go to the United States. They head down to South Africa. They head back up to India. They make their way over in the area of, of Australia. I mean, these are their main trading partners. These are the, the merchants of Tarshish. And they have been for hundreds of years, and they still are. And they say to the Gogian host that's come down from the north, have you, have you come to take a, a spoil and to take a prey? Why are you here? And it sounds as though they're helpless to do anything about it. Now that very well may have something to do with the, uh, the, the change in power that took place, or will take place, uh, this coming January. But uh, President-elect Trump, who knows what sort of state the, military, the United States military is going to be at that particular time. Uh, the whole Brexit situation, who knows what sort of uh, power and influence they're going to have uh, come the beginning of the new year. I mean, 
a lot is, is in upheaval right now at this particular time. And they say, have you? Have you come? Not as though they're going to do something about it. And they don't. They can't. And we're told in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 2, that when the northern invasion comes down, Jerusalem will be taken. Zechariah says, For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken. The houses rifled, the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity. The residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. I mean, this, this, we can read this and not understand the horror of what is about to happen. The city being taken, and just very briefly, the houses rifled and the women ravished. You can just think about that and the atrocities that are going to be committed at that particular time and what it will be like to be living in that city when the invading force comes through. And not only that, then they start to round up people and deport them. Now, when have we seen that happen before? The Jews being rounded up and deported and sent out. I mean, it, it, it's going to be a horrific time, briefly. I mean, the, the nation of Israel is going to be completely and utterly devastated by thinking that they have finally lost all hope. But it's at that time, again, like I've said, that God intervenes, does not allow his people to be completely destroyed. It's at that time then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. God is going to fight for his people. And who is he fighting against? Gog, of the land of Mago, Rosh, Meshach, Tubal, Dogarma, Persia, Libya. He's fighting against this, this unified force that has come against Israel. He says he's going to fight as he fought in the day of battle. Now when you think about how God has fought in the day of battle in times past, well, Ezekiel 38, verses 21 and 22 seem to make a lot of sense because we've seen these things happen before. He says, I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains, saith the Lord God. Every man's sword shall be against his brother. We've seen that happen before in scripture, right? Uh, Gideon and his 300 men going down against the Midianites, right? What happened? Gideon... And his men didn't have to lift up a sword. The Midianites all turned on each other because they were a unified force made up of different people. And they turned on each other out of fear and out of, of, of distrust. And they turned their swords on one another. And that's what, exactly what we're going to see again. right? Then he says in Ezekiel 38, 22, I will plead against him with pestilence, with blood. I will rain upon him, upon his bands, upon the many people that are with him, and overflowing rain, great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Natural forces are going to be at work. We've already talked about a great earthquake. But now natural forces are going to be at work to destroy the army from the north. And again, we've seen that before in the time of Samuel, the time of Joshua. Great hailstones came down and destroyed more than the sword ever did. God fought for his people and he's going to intervene again. He's going to send his son and his son is going to save the people of God. He's going to save his nation Israel from complete and total destruction. Now we have a lot more to say. Sorry I breezed through that I mean quickly. <laughs> I know we, there's a lot more we could talk about but that's what we're looking at. That northern invasion led by the Russian Confederacy, is going to be destroyed on the mountains of Israel. That's what their end is going to be. The evil thought is going to come to be the downfall of Gog and his forces. Now I have up here, just to finish up, you know, a, a visual from Daniel chapter 2. Nebuchadnezzar, the king, see this great image of the kingdom of men. He sees a stone. A stone comes down and it smites that image upon the foot and the image falls over. That's what we're looking at in Ezekiel chapter 38. When God intervenes and sends his son, 
that's going to knock this kingdom of men down for good. The time when Gog invades Israel. It doesn't end there, though. That stone then grows to be the kingdom of God, which then is going to encompass the entire earth. So even though what we're seeing is the growth of the power and the influence of Russia over the Middle East, over Europe, and its influence that's going to bring that uh, confederacy down into Israel, it is going to be brought to an end. It's got to be brought to an end by the return of Christ and the setting up the kingdom of God on earth. And that's what God intended the whole time. Because how does he end Ezekiel chapter 38? What's the last verse? It's going to destroy Gog on the mountains of Israel. Thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself. And I will be known in the eyes of many nations. And they shall know that I am the Lord. That's why he's bringing him down there. He's going to show his power, his might, his strength by the destruction of Gog and his army. And he's going to prove who his people are and that he is powerful to save and that he's merciful upon his people. So again, we have a lot more to say, but time is not uh, with us. So I'm going to bring it to an end there, and I thank you for your attention. And again, any things we talked about today, if you'd like to uh, talk to me later, I'm here. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Most of the world doesn't recognize that God's word tells what is going to happen today. And yet, as we've seen from what Mark has presented to us, he does quite specifically tell us what is going to happen right now. And it is happening in front of our eyes. And we are responsible to pay attention and to respond to what God has done. Let us close our meeting with a word of prayer. Would all rise? Beloved Lord and Father in heaven, Thou hast revealed so much in thy word. Thou hast given us hope. And with that hope, thou hast expressed to us the means by which that hope shall be accomplished. Most especially through the death and resurrection of thy son. And by our adherence to the things that he preached and thou hast presented throughout thy word. But thou hast also presented, Father, the things that thou shalt do in order to bring thy kingdom upon this earth. And thou hast revealed them to the children of men, and it is our responsibility to pay attention and to respond to the things that thou hast revealed. Help us, Father, not just to read these things, but to read with understanding, and then not just to understand it, but to live our lives in accordance with it, that when these things do come to pass, we might be found acceptable in thy sight. Help us, Father, to walk in thy ways. We pray through your Son, our Lord Jesus the Christ, for whom we wait. Amen.
I handed a bottle of water to Seth. Oh, thank you, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right. <laughs> well, that's good. That's good. That's good. Similar thinking. Great. The Bible school needs It really is. It really is. That's why I said I wanted to pull out some articles that have just happened within the last month, so you could you, know, you could see it. It's like oh, all these things are coming together, just like I mean he's becoming the king of the north. I mean that's that's what he's doing. Yeah, it's really interesting.